So we're gonna begin at in the beginning. How do you how your family arrived to Tucson, and um, you know just talk about your parents and everything. Okay. So my mom was born and raised here in Tucson. She's a third generation Tucsonan. Her side of the family they migrated from Mexico. Um, on my dad's side of family, he uh, actually was born and raised in Texas, and then the family moved to Nebraska, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. And uh, when he went into the uh, military during the Korean War, he was, after the war ended, he was stationed at Davis Mountain Air Force Base. And then that's where he was here in Tucson, met my mom. So from that point forward, our family has been pretty much here in Tucson. Um, and then I, I personally have, I was born on the base, but I have lived uh, sporadically in other states. Uh, we moved to LA for a short time in the 60s. Uh, right after the Watts riots, we had, reloc we had just relocated there because my dad was an employee at Hughes Aircraft. Uh -huh. It's funny how this all kind of connects with the topic. Uh, he worked at Hughes Aircraft uh, during the 60s, 50s and 60s, and uh, he got laid off, so he had to find a job and ended up finding a job with Fort Mortar Company in Pico Rivera, which is in L.A. And we, so we moved over there, and we were over there for about seven years or so, and then we moved back. So, and I was in the military. Uh, I lived in, in Denver for a while in Phoenix. Uh, I was overseas for a few years. But mostly after we, I got out of the military, um, except for a couple of years in Phoenix when I was working up there, we, uh, we've been pretty much in Tucson. And where did you meet your wife? My wife, she was born and raised here in Tucson. Um, her grandmother and her mom are both uh, native Tucsonans. They um, originally uh, go back to where they... Um, the X9 Ranch, which is on the east side of Tucson, um, my my mother-in-law always tell me the story how she grew up on a ranch. It was the X9 Ranch, and her grandfather ran the ranch for the the rancher who owned it, who was actually out of Michigan. He was a self-made millionaire. Always wanted to be a rancher. Came to Arizona, bought a ranch, came out here a couple times a year. But the ranch was really operated by my uh, mother-in-law's grandfather. So. My mother-in-law grew up on the ranch, and she always told me stories about that. And then they moved to south part of Tucson. They were uh, they lived there. Uh, her husband, who is Yaki, uh, my my father-in-law is Yaki, and uh, my wife is also Yaki. So they built a home in um, south part of Tucson, off of between Liberty and Twelfth, and just north of Irvington. So they lived within the study. The super fun study area. Um, and so my wife ended up going to Pueblo High School. She went to all the schools there, you know, in that area, public schools. Um, and so she she pretty much lived her entire life in that, in the south side until we got married. And then we bought a home and moved to another location. And did you attend any of the schools down in south side Tucson? I was um, actually where my dad built a house, we lived in the city of South Tucson, which is a little bit north of, well, it's just south of 22nd. Um, so I lived in the South Side, but not as south, far south as my wife did. Um, but we did, live a, I, we did live for a short time in my mother-in-law's home because when uh, my wife and I married, I got went into the military, came back, uh, and um, I returned to school full time. We moved back in with her, which was the same house my wife lived in. So we uh, we lived there for about six, seven years before we finally were able to move away and buy another home. So I lived in the in the same location my wife did for a short time too. And then we had four children, so our kids grew up for a short time. Went in those to schools in the South Side too. And what was that era? So when we moved back, uh, it was uh, back in about 87 or 88, I'm thinking, that we lived there. 
uh, with my wife and our four children in my mother-in-law's home. And that's in the Liberty area. That's right. right. Uh huh. Okay. And um, was any of your wife's family or your family impacted by the contamination that you know of? Well, that's a tough question to answer because uh, being that I have probably been exposed to a lot more of the science and uh, behind it and the studies and how the methodology uh, back when things were really very tough time for most people because there was a lot of emotions and uh, there was a class action lawsuit that was getting uh, pushed to sue the responsible parties. Uh, the uh, the um, agency, the Center for Disease Control, came in and did a health study to see if there was any connection with the cancer cluster that supposedly uh, was becoming more evident with direct link to drinking contaminated uh, groundwater. Um, so there's, you know, and having that knowledge, I think to answer that question, were they directly affected? It's hard to say yes, maybe, but uh, my wife and daughter, well, my mother-in-law and my and uh, her mom both passed away from breast cancer. Uh, my wife's father had uh, prostate cancer and lung cancer. He passed from that. My wife is a high risk, and so are all our children. Uh, they have not been tested for that particular gene that they can identify, but the reason why we know is because they've had to have certain tests where they had cysts removed because it was potentially cancerous, and fortunately they haven't been, my wife and daughter. But our oldest son, um, when he was 26, came down with breast cancer, full-blown breast cancer, and that was kind of a shock because he was so young for one, but the fact that he was a male and us not realizing that men can get breast cancer. Uh, apparently 1% of males do get breast cancer. Um, so he went through the whole nightmare of the treatments, radiation, chemotherapy. He basically had equivalent to what a double mastectomy would have been, even though it didn't disfigure him the same way as it would have been a woman. And then he did follow-up treatments after it. It literally took him a whole year to go through all that. Um, so to say if there's any connection with, you know, what maybe he grew up in the South Side when we were living there for a short time and, and prior to, you know, the wells probably getting shut down, I don't know. But the fact that our family has had several cases or, or experience with dealing with cancer, and then I've got cancer, I got prostate cancer, uh, it's been in remission now for four years, which... Again, it's hard to say because there's so many variables that can impact, you know, and say whether, you know, it's one specific thing that could have uh, caused the illness. Uh, so our family has dealt with a lot of the, the illnesses that most of the people that had had similar experiences in the South Side. Yeah, we, we've dealt with the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so you talked a little bit about your, you know, using science in answering this question. When did you begin um, becoming interested in studying or going into the sciences? Well, when I, when I had to go back to school and I realized there was a, the economy had kind of tanked and I hadn't quite gotten my, my bachelor's degree yet after I got out of the military, I decided to go back and finish. I decided to change my major. I was originally a biology major. Uh, thought maybe my, my parents were probably influencing me to think that I was going to be a dentist at that time, <laughs> I remember. But I decided that I uh, had already been working in the economy, started realizing that back then in the mid-80s, a lot of the environmental uh, issues were starting to be more prominent and what EPA was doing, the roles in Superfund sites, and, and, and there was a Superfund uh, effort to go and clean up the major sites. And at that time, we had starting things were brewing up with the Tucson Airport Superfund site. So when I went back to school, I, I, I saw better, uh, more of an interest in environmental sciences and in engineering. But at that time, when I went back, they didn't have a specific major for that. 
U of A did not have a major for environmental engineering or environmental science. So fortunately, I had an uh, advisor that was willing to work with me and realized that because I was an older than typical student you would find, uh, he was willing to work with me and find the, the courses that would substitute for the same type of curriculum had, I, had they had a major in that particular area. So I would petition courses in the engineering field uh, department and then some in the soils and water department, you know, under the agri College of Agriculture. I uh, worked in the um, research lab there with Dr. Artiola. I uh, did a lot of the testing for soils and, and, and water. So I got more indoctrinated into the methodology of the science and the chemistry. Uh, and so I, I was able to at least uh, tailor it to what I thought would be useful for me as, you know, went out in the, in the economy and tried to find another job because I knew what courses would gonna, were going to be useful not just to take a, a list of courses that had nothing to do with my interests were. So fortunately, I was able to get um, interdisciplinary degree, but on my diploma, it says soil and water science. Mm -hmm. But it's a mix of engineering and science, so uh, I was able to uh, get kind of both, a good you know balance of both types of courses under my for my education. And then I was fortunate, uh, I knew... Raul Grijalva, who was then a board of, well, he was a board of supervisors still before he became the congressman. I knew him well because my wife, uh, when we lived, my wife lived a block away from him. Uh, and I knew him well because when he was uh, on the school board for Tucson School District 1, we knew him back then. So we went back quite a ways and I reached out to him. I said, I, I, you know, Maybe I, is there an internship or work study or something that I, that, you know, might be within the county that I could work? I was kind of thinking ahead. Fortunately, he uh, was able to get me interviewed with the Pima County Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, I was hired as a senior hydrologist, and kind of from that point forward is where my career kind of started, you know, in this environmental industry. Uh, I was uh, involved with a lot of the because the Pima County uh, DEQ was mostly a regulatory agency for the county, so they monitored uh, the the uh, water uh, water quality for all the water companies in the county, uh, for except for a few that were excluded out of that. So we did a lot of the water testing. We would review reports, and we also the air quality program. We would monitor and, and uh, compliance with that area. Uh, so from that. It kind of got involved with a lot of the similar things that, that have to do with water quality in general. But uh, right about that time, uh, the, uh, the, the, a lot of the controversy with the uh, Superfund site and the South site started to really start to get more uh, coverage in the paper and the news media. And I guess at that time, they didn't have... Uh, a structured uh, a group or a forum for the everyone to meet on a regular basis when EPA and uh, ADQ would come and visit with all the responsible parties and the community. Back then, this was prior to the Unified Community Advisory Board, they had what they called the uh, TCE, which was the Tucson Coalition for the Environment. I can't remember. It was an acronym. But it was... Uh, it was a group of people that uh, it wasn't very structured, uh, but there was a lot of community involved with that. Unfortunately, not a lot of productive discussions came out of those meetings because it was more of a opportunity for the community to really voice their opinion about their mistrust in the government, especially like the city and EPA and the state. And primarily because Tucson Water was the water provider for the south side, that, that kind of put a bullseye in all those different agencies. And Pima County wasn't involved in that much, but one of the, uh, I, knew, uh, one of the I knew a few of the original members of the Unified the UCAB. Uh, but prior to that, I didn't know they were involved with this. And someone reached out to the county and said, we need 
we need a technical representative to come that is doesn't represent the city, doesn't represent EPA or the state. We need somebody because a lot of the technical information that was being presented was not being presented in a way that they could understand the information. So it was very overwhelming for them. A lot of the terms were, were you know, didn't make any sense as to what they meant, like parts per billion or parts per million. Uh, a lot of the terms, TCE, PCE, PCB, all those are acronyms that we're used to because we're, we're, we've, we've gone to school to learn what those mean were very confusing to people. So they wanted somebody that could help them explain to them uh, without any bias to see, to kind of give them the layman's version of what these, this information was, you know, about. So they asked me to start going to these meetings and they were monthly at, uh, back then. Uh, and then uh, I was with the Pima County uh, DQ for about four years. And then the city of Tucson went through a transition where they were starting to start, uh, they were starting a new office uh, that was going to be called the Environmental Management Office. And this was back in 1993, I believe, when the mayor and council decided we need a central office that understands environmental issues and, man and can manage it properly and address with uh, health concerns of, you know, related to water and, and soil contamination. Uh, and I had an opportunity to get interviewed for a position they had there. I was hired as an environmental scientist originally. And from that point forward, uh, it was interesting. Uh, the whole project was all the time uh, being managed under Tucson Water because obviously they were involved in the early uh, stages of, of sharing information to the public. One thing that it's hard to, to understand is there's two different types of uh, processes going on. One is um, where Tucson Water is under a different consent decree where it involves all the major responsible parties like Raytheon, the Airport Authority. Uh, and under that consent decree, it was a way for the agencies to get some progress made where they can get wells in place, get a, a water treatment plant constructed and start pumping the groundwater and keep it from migrating further north. So that was the intent for that. Uh, they got the parties agreed, they funded the project, they did the um, uh, remedial investigation and, and came up with a preferred remedy based on the cost. They go through all those different processes that EPA requires. And so they built TARP. TARP is the treatment plant that was originally built off of Irvington. Um, and uh, that was controlling the plume from migrating further north and trying to make sure that there was not spreading any more than it was already at that time. But when I worked, for, when I started working for the city, um, Tucson Water was managing it. And then we hired an employee that came from Tucson Water over to the environmental management office. And the agreement with the directors back then was, okay, you can take this employee, but uh, he's going to take this project with him. Uh, I didn't know the agreement, but apparently he brought, he was the one that was heading up. Uh, he was spearheading the project for Tucson Water that had to do with all of TARP and uh, all the uh, different activities and, and reviewing reports and meeting with all the different agencies and uh but he didn't stay very long at our office, so he went back to Tucson Water. The project didn't go back with him. It stayed in our office. And because of the history I had, our directors suggested that I take over the project. Um, an interesting story, when I first got informed that I was going to be now in charge of this project, and because of the controversy with the public not trusting the city, Tucson Water, but the city as a whole, uh, they, they had really a lot of mistrust because they were uh, a lot of people were affected by supposedly by the groundwater they were drinking. Um, this particular employee still had to go back. We would meet regularly with EPA back in San Francisco at the headquarters office, and so I went with him. Uh, this was my first visit meeting with EPA and also getting introduced to the other parties that were involved with the airport. Uh, project, which was a different consent decree. Uh, they hadn't yet 
formalize the consent decree. They were in negotiation still. So I came in early when they were still trying to get that worked out. So I met the other parties involved with the airport, uh, which was, um, the Air Force was, a, was the major player in that. Uh, General Dynamics, uh, who is now Boeing, they, they merged. And uh, no, General Dynamics, and then it was uh, McDonnell Douglas who, who merged with Boeing. So, and then the city of Tucson, there was five individual responsible parties, potentially responsible parties at that time. The EPA had, had identified that were responsible for managing and doing cleanup at the airport property only. Uh, so those negotiations were kind of ongoing. When I went to San Francisco, was the first time I met my uh, future uh, cohorts that we were going to work on this project, and I met Fred Brinker for the first time there. Um, so from that point forward, we kind of built a relationship because uh, I, I've been now introduced where uh, this other employee was no longer involved with the project. So from that point forward, we started working together. The, the odd thing about this project within the city of Tucson was it, it was kind of like a black hole uh, there was only one person managing. You can, if you can understand, this person from water was kind of managing everything. Uh, other than an attorney that was involved occasionally, he managed everything for the city and periodically would update the director or the city manager. But no other people in the city were involved. Uh, he might have had some staff to help him with administrative, you know, managing the documentation, um, other things that were required as the what they call the... Um, he was actually the um, project coordinator for the airport site itself, just specifically for the airport property. Um, so when it got transferred to me, I didn't have the luxury of any staff, so I had to coordinate everything. Uh, and then I would meet regularly with the other parties. We had meetings and we met with the agencies, EPA, ADQ. Um, so as we went forward, um, and we had a, finally gotten a consent decree in place. We, um, once things got on autopilot, everything kind of just quieted down. And so it's hard to know whether this project is, is how the city is involved as time went. But part of that was I went to the UCAB meetings. And so the UCAB meetings would require us to go do updates. And so the community would know that my involvement. But unfortunately, back then in the early years, it was very, very uh, hard to get up in front of the, the audience because there was still a lot of bitterness and frustration um, because of you, rep you representing the city. You can imagine that they're, they're voicing their frustration at you. And so it was very hard to you know get up and, and try to show that you're trying to be uh, trustworthy uh, sharing information that was truthful, factual. Uh, at, so it was really hard to get up in front of those audiences. At, at one point, it was so tough that EPA uh, didn't come for like six months. Essentially, one of these meetings, they got ran out of town. EPA was so, I guess, humiliated or whatever it is that back then, whoever came down, they, they felt that I don't want to go back to that place. Uh, so uh, it was very tough to get in front of the, you know, this audience, and because there was still a lot of this, this, it was, everything was still kind of new, and it was affecting their families. And I think that was part of the emotions that was coming out at the meetings, voicing those opinions they had of the agencies not doing enough or not getting it done fast enough. And I agreed with them totally because I could understand their their point of view. Um, but they eventually came back, but Tucson Water also stopped coming to the meetings. And I still kept going, mm -hmm. uh, but they would ask me questions once in a while to speak on behalf of Tucson Water. Well, I wasn't an employee of Tucson Water, and I couldn't answer the questions honestly or factually, so I would tell them that, you know, if I can't answer it, I'll get you the answer. And all this time I could see that my purpose was more as uh, trying to deliver or get information to them that was factual and try to build some level of trust with the community. 
not only with the UCAM members, but also with, with those that came to the meetings that would want to hear the updates. So it was, it was tough for about, I don't know, I guess four, five, six years. It was really hard. Uh, I would even go out to some of the, uh, like Apollo Middle School had a parent-teacher uh, association that wanted us to come talk to them. We went and we were just personally attacked. Uh, I was personally attacked. And, and so there was a lot of that still entrenched in people's emotions. It was hard to just talk productively. And, and there was a lack of trust. That was the main thing. So I felt that my role was, even though I was being personally attacked, uh, I still felt that it was important to be there present at the meetings regardless if I was able to convince anyone that I had, you know, the information that was factual, uh, that we weren't covering up anything. And I think that was the main thing that the public felt, that the city or the agencies or we're all collectively trying to hide something uh, because it had gone so long unnoticed before they determined that these wells had been impacted by uh, TCE. So that, that was kind of my role early on uh, as I started progressing with the city. And then it came to a point where uh, uh, I became an ex-official member of UCAB when they first started UCAB. Mm -hmm. uh, the only difference was I, I participated on the UCAB board, but I was not a voting member. So that was, that was because there was a conflict of interest for me to vote on issues that obviously I represented one of the responsible parties. Mm -hmm. And then Fred Brinker came in later. Uh, he took over my lead role. We switched uh, roles because there was a lot of uh, litigation going on and, and he had uh, been asked to kind of just stay out of that very toxic environment, not knowing if, if people were gonna try to, uh, try to extract information for their own purposes. And you know, it was very tough. And, and so uh, his employer said, until we can get things worked out, uh, then we can start to participate. So then once all that got settled through the tort litigation, he came in and started participating in those meetings. And I stepped back uh, in a different role, but still represented the city of Tucson. So that's how my, my professional career has kind of progressed. I know it's been kind of a, a, a long drawn out, but I think I've been involved with UCAB and, and, and the South Side uh, whole issue with the Tucson Airport Superfund site for probably about 24, 25 years. I think Fred Brinker's the only other one I think is one of the few that's been there longer than I have. Uh, I retired from the city of Tucson two years ago, so I, I, I haven't been participating here recently, but uh, that kind of goes back to the history of how I got involved and how my career kind of brought me to this, this role. And so prior, I'm interested in finding out uh, prior that you worked in in the actual site and worked for the city of Tucson. When did you first hear about the contamination? Um, well, you know, just like anyone else, I wasn't, uh, our family, my wife's family got contacted by people that were working for the law firm that was doing the tort litigation. That was when we first, and then of course it was coming out in the media and newspapers. Um, so that's really how we learned more about it initially. Uh, and in kind of a odd way, I got pulled into this project. So I had a lot of factual information. I, I became like the technical advisor for my family mm -hmm. because they could ask me the questions that they know they could get the right answer instead of trying to rely on a friend's opinion or a relative's opinion or the newspapers, uh, which not many people trusted what was getting reported. Uh, you know, it was really a lot of bad information. Not bad, but it was not factual. And a lot of times, you know, you, you, you can kind of uh, misinterpret facts. And, and, and it kind of, once you do that, it's hard to undo because people believe what, what you've told them, even though it's not the exact truth. So I would advise my, my family. Unfortunately, they, you know, my family had a different opinion of all that because they had friends and relatives that got involved with that tort litigation. A lot of them were able to get some money out of it. And they had heard that some that were in part of that didn't even have an illness. Somehow, 
it's it just seemed to be like a a, a witch hunt, you know, to just go out and these attorneys were going to go out, try to get this uh, settlement with you know all the responsible parties and get some money up front for the people that were affected that signed up for the tort litigation. Our family didn't, and mainly because my wife kind of put it probably in in a better perspective of why they didn't get involved because they kind of understood there was a lot of people getting sick and a lot of people were lower income didn't even probably have insurance uh, a lot of the the symptoms were not being diagnosed early enough until they were too ill um, so you know they, they they had met with some individuals and had gone to a couple meetings and they they stood up at the meeting and remember, she says she remembers saying that oh well where's this money going to go if you win this this uh, case and they said well it's going to go to individual families based on whatever formula they come up with based on your illness and how many of the family members were ill I said well, why don't you put some of this money into a separate fund so that people that don't have any illness now but could be affected later on and don't have any way to cover their medical expenses, that that fund could help provide to be reimbursed or help pay for those medical expenses. And uh, she said that they were turned off by the attorney. They kind of cut them short. It, it, it didn't seem to be one of the things they wanted to hear. They, they were not there to to listen to the public. They were there to kind of, go forward with this tort litigation. And they already had a plan in mind and they already had a strategy, it was obvious, but they really didn't have the best interest of the community. And I think that's what turned off my family, my wife's family, that they didn't want to get involved with that. That was probably the main reason because they saw that it was just all about money, not about taking care of those that really needed uh, the help, financial assistance to deal with some of the illnesses they were dealing with. Um, so that's kind of how we learned about that. And then, of course, through work, I started getting more involved with it. And, I, of course, I got more information than I ever thought I would need. But then I would get more involved with the factual information, all the science and the engineering behind it, all the studies, uh, all the bad data and the good data and all the data sharing we had with all the other responsible parties uh, as we went forward with you know doing multiple studies on throughout this airport site, as well as the, the larger study area that was impacted. I think it's also really neat that you're a, a technical advisor to, to the community in addition to your family. How you were talking about um, that you worked with the community members that were pre-Unified Community Advisory Board and then into the Unified Community Advisory Board, that you kind of were there to interpret a lot of this data that was coming out that I'm sure nowadays it's more, you know, there's more of this push for this translation of science, what they call. Mm -hmm. But I guess that in that time there wasn't. So I'm sure you had right. a big job. <laughs> yeah, it, it got to a point where eventually uh, the UCAB applied for a TAG grant, which is a technical assistance grant through EPA, where they could uh, contract out to a an engineer or scientist that was very uh, capable of uh, looking at the reports and interpreting the data and then giving a, a much more simpler version of what the report was trying to explain. Uh, they, it was a $50,000 grant, as a matter of fact, I think I remember. So that from that point forward, my role kind of wasn't as necessary to help UCAB to try to, I, I don't know if it was hard because a lot of people still didn't believe I was there to, I, I, I don't think they really trusted me fully yet, other than I think the Pima County was the lesser of all evils at that time. So they were willing to at least have someone there. And, and I, got a, I got to build a really good relationship with the Campillos. Um, also Manny Herrera, who was one of the earlier UCAP uh, chairman, he was very influential in getting, kind of spearheading uh, from TCE as it transitioned to UCAB. And one of the things I forgot to mention, it was it was very difficult for the agencies, the EPA and ADQ. They, they came from, uh, EPA came from San Francisco once a month, and they would have to literally meet uh, in multiple meetings with separate groups. One was 
all related to Raytheon, the Air Force site, and then uh, that kind of involved the TARP, the, the bigger site, the bigger study area. And then there was a separate group of meetings they had to meet separately with the airport super fund, uh, the airport property, which was my involvement mostly. Uh, it got to be very uh, tough to schedule so many meetings with so many people, and then also having a meeting with the public in two different forms. And the Air Force and EPA have similar processes with Superfund. I've learned that they don't have the same check boxes, but they are pretty, pretty similar. So I think early in the back then it was it, it was it came to a point where they agreed, EPA and the Air Force agreed, we need to merge our process and, and just follow one process so it meets the needs of both, but mostly because we need to find a way that we can not have so many meetings and get the the community more involved because the meetings were very one-sided if you didn't want to hear anything to do with one particular group you didn't go to that meeting and then you went to the other meeting so there wasn't the information wasn't being shared i think you know equally uh so then once they decided that's what started ucap they, they we had a charter uh, I was involved with all that. You know, they developed a charter. EPA was involved in kind of leading everyone through that. Uh, ADQ was involved with that. And then they assigned uh, the, the co-chair, was the committee co-chair, and then EPA was the other co-chair. And from that point forward, you know, it kind of kept that structure. Uh, I, I, I've been thankful to be able to participate and learn from a lot of the community members because... Some of the members had a different perspective and it helps kind of, I think it's always good to, to be challenged to see if you really feel like you're doing the right thing or doing enough. And, and so I think sometimes that's where I thought the value of UCAP was, it was constantly pushing us, uh, the responsible parties and possibly the agencies to do more. You think you've done everything, but maybe you haven't. Uh, and so I think it was a good way to kind of keep everyone uh, in striving for the best that they could do, given what the information they had in front of them. Um, so UCAB was very influential, I think, in, in getting an organized effort for the community to get involved on one platform. And then from that point forward, uh, it, it, it things seemed to calm down more. People were starting to make build relationships with individuals on both sides. Uh, and that was where I felt my role was to continue to build on that relationship, to build trust. That's really what it came down to. Because if you don't really trust someone, no matter what they have to say, you're not going to believe it. So uh, I think uh, I reached out to a lot of the members that we built a, a mutual respect over time. Uh, Henry Vega was one. Uh, him, he's actually... Uh, he worked with my dad at the school district at Santa Rita High School. There was a relationship there already before I even met Henry. Uh, so uh, we already had somewhat of a, a, a lot in common because he knew my dad so well. And uh, so we built a close relationship over time with, with him as well. And there's a lot of other members. Uh, Anne Montaño was one of the earlier members uh, and there's other names I'm sure I'm forgetting that they were very influential in kind of getting that whole process more structured to be more productive so that everyone could come to one meeting and, and share the information that they and get the information that they needed. Uh, and then, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, EPA's budget started to get cut back and it was tougher for them to come every month. So now they come quarterly and that's where we're at. That's where they're at now. Uh, so that's kind of how that kind of over time had, had transitioned from the very beginning. Can you talk a little bit about your, um, the main contributions as a professional on the cleanup of the site? Well, initially it was more just to build trust. Uh, I think that was my primary role because uh, even though I had the technical experience and background, uh, I was I, I felt that the city had to build a lot of trust with the community. And um, earlier, back then, I think Tucson Water didn't do as well in that category. 
Uh, they've had several people represent them in the UCABs and they've been kind of run out of the meeting essentially because they, of the the things that were, they weren't very sensitive to some of the issues, how they were explaining. I don't think they did it intentionally, but I don't think they had that connection with the community, felt that uh, they were very, um, I don't know what's I don't know what the word is, but they didn't feel they didn't show any emotion or, or caringness behind what they were presenting. And I think the people could see that. And and I think that's the main reason why they challenged a lot of the people that spoke to the public in these meetings. Uh you can tell when somebody's been sincere, you know. And I think it wasn't intentional, it's just the fact that that was their personality. And so that if it comes across that way, that means I can't trust you. But you know, that didn't mean that they weren't sharing good information. Um, and plus, it was hard to uh, undo the damage from the past, you know, that they mistrusted, they didn't trust that the city was delivering clean water. And I think up till to now, today, I, I hear that there's a, a group of people that feel that Tucson water is not, or the city of Tucson, or even the EPA and ADQ have done enough to protect the health and make sure that the residents are getting clean drinking water. Uh, it, it's very, you know, it's very hard to explain why the South Side is not getting that water anymore because TARP doesn't deliver that water there. It comes to a different zone within Tucson Water that delivers water. It actually covers downtown and, and further west and north of this area that was originally impacted. But a lot of people I, I've hear once in a while, you'll get people that don't believe that because maybe there's a delayed uh, onset of an illness that maybe took 15, 20 years, and now they feel that it's directly related to drinking contaminated groundwater. And uh, because they talked to their neighbors or other people have been affected, uh, they they really truly believe that maybe they're it's because they're still drinking contaminated uh, drinking water, but uh, no matter how much we try to present, uh, Tucson Water has been very good. They have a great program going out and testing your water out of your tap, different uh, faucets in the house, outside, just to show that there's no impact, that the water quality is safe to drink. And they've always been very open in going out and offering that service. Um, in some cases, maybe, you know, they they helped people even more than that just to show that they're willing to meet with them, to explain them, show them the data. Um, you know, Tucson Water is a public water company. They're required by law to sample the water every month and provide that data. It's public information. And, and so they, they've tried to build on that to help people feel more comfortable that they're drinking safe uh, water. Um, so my original, I thought, was more is just to build trust with the community. That was what I thought, because... No matter what I had technically to offer was was not going to be useful, at least not in that venue. But on on the other side, where I met with my cohorts in the in in the meetings, as we tried to meet with EPA and ADQ to to figure out what the remedy would be upon all the studies and all the data that we had, and and how to develop the, the most cost effective remedy that we could put in place to treat the contaminated water that was on the airport property only, which centered a lot in the three hangars area, which is why a lot of the reports you always hear about the three hangars. Well, there's a there's a smaller area um, which has uh, got high concentrations, and, and so it, it's an area where the airport has been trying to clean up, uh, and uh, it's mostly just source control. It, it, it's... They got a water treatment system in place, much smaller than what TARP is, but similar, and so does Raytheon. And um, they have a, a system where it has a, a series of wells to control the plume so it doesn't migrate off property anymore, uh, vertically or horizontally, because a lot of that gets very technical in the science and engineering about how you have all these different zones in, in the Vado zone, which is above groundwater. You have clay, you have gravel, you have sand, you, and so it's really tough to engineer the right system that's going to be effective. So that's why you do all these studies and reporting and, and getting wells in place to get data to understand really where the, the, the hot spot is, where the, the highest source of contamination is, so you can 
start to impact and, and, and effectively clean it up. Uh, right now, there's no remedy really to, no technology that can clean up this small little area that's right by the three hangar. So it's mostly just pump and treat. You know, we, we pump the water, we treat it, uh, but then that's re-injected into the deeper aquifer where it's clean. So it essentially doesn't impact any more than what's already been impacted in the past. Uh, so that's the simple, you know, engineering behind that treatment system. And TARP is much the same way. They, they pump the contaminant water, they treat it, and then they re-inject it into these injection wells, which goes outside of the plume. And the concept is, so if you're plumbing outside the plume, it'll start to, groundwater will start to rise, and it kind of forces the plume to shrink. And it kind of helps that plume to start to get narrower, more controlled. So in a way, groundwater is controlling that plume from going outward, horizontally, and then vertically as well. And that's where all the engineering comes in, of course, uh, understanding water quality and, and all the different types of soil you have to deal with. Um, so that, that contribution on my part when being involved representing the city, which uh, I thought was very unique, I guess is the word I want to use, because I, uh, I understood that the parties collectively uh, had to come up with some uh, agreement on how to treat the contaminant water that's on airport property. So that's where this separate consent decree comes up. And under that consent decree, we have the legal, I guess, parameters set out that what our objective is. And then the ROD, which is the record of decision that comes out after, is it kind of gives you kind of a guideline of what are the milestones that you're supposed to follow through, the protocol and all that. It just gives you a structure about what you're supposed to do and how you go about it and how you work with EPA to make sure they're getting that information, sharing it with the public, uh, how to go back and revisit things uh, periodically as technology changes. So that's the essence of the ROD. I, it's a lot more complicated than that, but uh, my role in that was early on was to represent the city of Tucson. And then that's where it starts to get a little interesting because at that point, the EPA told all the parties, which was the Air Force, the Airport Authority, the city of Tucson, General Dynamics, and McDonnell Douglas, they have a process what they call cost allocation. And there's a couple ways where you can go and, and there's multiple parties involved. You go into your camp, you figure out who gets what piece of the pie and how much it's going to cost. You come back to EPA and tell them, okay, this is the whole amount we think it's going to take to clean up this site. And this is the percentage of each individual party that's going to contribute. And you have to show that you financially are capable of funding that. So my role then became much different than what it was now because now we're negotiating somewhat where each of us had our own attorneys. So we're kind of now... Uh, in a way, trying to position where we are trying to obviously lessen our liability, for one, because that's the whole idea. You know, you don't want to pay more than you think you're liable for. But the Air Force always admitted they were the lion's share of that because they were the reason why those contractors that were working in the three hangers area contributed to the contamination because they were using the, the chemicals that got into the soil and groundwater. So the Air Force never denied that. But the other four parties, the smaller parties involved, uh, we knew that we have a, a much smaller role in it. How much small is, is where it gets really tricky because now we know the Air Force took the lion's share, but the rest of the four had to decide how do you divide up the, the remainder of whatever the percentages break out. So that's where we all had to go to our own uh, uh, employers and talk to them and say, look, this is what we got to deal with now. And we got to come back and tell EPA, this is how we're going to divide up the pie. So the city of Tucson at that time was smart enough, very, very, at that time we had a, a city manager that were, it was very uh, uh, wise in, in outsourcing it to an attorney who was an environmental attorney out of Phoenix, and he was very good. So we had good representation legally. So we were able to come back to the table, decide 
uh, and it didn't get ugly. So we came back and we decided, okay, this is how much we all have. We feel that our percentage is this much. Um, the biggest, I think the biggest satisfaction I get out of that effort was the city of Tucson was able to come back to the table with the other parties. And we were able to have them agree that the city had zero liability. In other words, we didn't have to pay a penny into the uh, remedy to clean up the contamination on the airport property only. And the reason why that's so important is because uh, I personally felt, and I'm sure a few of the people high up in the chain of command within the city understood clearly, who's going to pay for that ultimately? Well, it's the taxpayers. So because of that, uh, I think uh, I think that was a big that was a big achievement for the community, uh, even though they didn't understand that at that time, and probably aren't well aware that the city residents as a whole doesn't have to pay a tax or whatever they were going whatever way they could come up to pay to come up with a remedy to pay for that to fund the, the cleanup on the airport property. So I think that my contribution in getting involved with that was, I think, was one of the biggest accomplishments. I feel like we, we were able to successfully convince the other parties that the city had no role. And, and the simple reason was the city was not uh, managing the airport during the time when the, the contamination took place. A lot of the history goes back to the when did, the city of Tucson owns the airport property, but they lease it to the airport authority to manage the airport. But the city, when they first bought the airport, did manage and operate the airport during the late 40s. So it was about a four or five year period, roughly, where the city actually owned it and operated as airport. That was prior to when all these contractors started coming onto the three hangar area and started doing a lot of the uh, retrofitting for the aircraft, you know, that needed to be, uh, had put new engines in, you know, that to, and because of that, they had to take apart and all of the solvent degreasers that created the contamination is what was going on during that time. So that was, the, you know, one of the big reasons why the city um, was able to convince the other parties. And, 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 you know, there's a lot of other stuff that go, went on with that, but I can't share that. But, you know, essentially it's, it was, you know, you can look back in history and you can dig up that information. It's not like it's difficult to find if you go back far enough. So that was one of my biggest, I think, accomplishments. We had good representation from outside. We were able to go in there successfully, get everyone to agree to that. As we move forward, then my next role was kind of how do we continue uh, actively cleaning up the source area, you know? And so <laughs> in my, I can't even remember how many uh, project managers we went through with EPA. I, 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 I have to say it's at least over 10. And through all those years that I was involved, that we've had so many different project managers representing EPA. And some were very short time and some were, you know, for an extended amount of time. But one of the most difficult things was is to try to re-educate a new person that represented EPA and get them to a point where there was a level of trust, but also that there was some productive exchange of very technical information in these meetings. Uh, I mean, some of these meetings, that you don't get out of a room for, for two days, three days. They bring lunch in. You know, you eat as you, you you continue the meeting as you go. You might break for a half hour, but it's constant data, constant uh, hydrology, geology, engineering. That's just going back and forth and, and and trying to make some sense of what it means and how do we, what do we do with it? And how do we get to a better place? Because now we have all this data, and, and it's very frustrating when you get someone new that doesn't understand the site. Now EPA does is able to bring in what they call an oversight contractor, which is their technical representative. So they can hire another environmental engineering firm to come help represent them. So they can kind of um, digest all this information. They can take it back and give EPA the short version of what they think the report might say that we share with them. Uh, but 
sometimes we could see that it wasn't very uh, productive because if we, you can imagine we're sitting across negotiating with EP and ADK. Look, this is what we feel. Uh, this is our view of the world. This is why we think how the contamination got there, where it's going, how we can treat it. And then you have someone that's working for the EPA who's a paid contractor. How would it be that they would agree with our position so they would never agree? Because they wouldn't have a job, <laughs> essentially. So we could see sometimes that there was a, a lot of debate on who was right, who was wrong. And it, in every one of those situations, I can say, it wasn't so much that we disagreed on what the alternative, what we needed to do, the objective, the main objective, get the site cleaned up as quick as possible, as cost-efficient as possible. So, but there was always disagreement how we get there. Not the fact that we didn't agree that we need, it needs to get cleaned up. No one wants to be in a cleanup business for the next 50 years. Um, that's why the Air Force bought out on that. They put in their allotment when we decided how much who gets a piece of the pie and how much percentage of that pie is the Air Force agreed. This is our portion. We gave you all the funding and they essentially bought themselves out of that, that whole site because the Air Force didn't want to be in the cleanup business forever. So it was actually a, a much higher level decision beyond our level. So um, we were left, the four parties then were left to manage the site with the airport authority, which was Fred Brinker's role, is to kind of lead that effort. Um, so it, it, it's very frustrating when, when you're trying to show to someone that, look, we, we have the same goals in mind. We really want to do the same thing, but we disagree how to get there. And almost every time that would be the thing that would keep us from getting to the next, next level or next step that we wanted to accomplish. Once in a while, we made some progress, and sometimes we go back. And that was the most frustrating thing. But I think that the fact that um, I, I learned a lot from my other, the other representatives from the other parties, because they all, we all brought a different perspective. We all brought a different strength, I think. And my contribution to that was, I think, uh, and these these people have been involved with super fun sites throughout the country. Because you got to imagine if you're. If you're aircraft manufacturer, you probably have plants all over the country. So they had different Superfund sites all over. So that was their job. They, they'd been through this rodeo before. This was my first rodeo, so I'm learning as I go. But one of the things I learned that I did have a value in, in after I kind of understood all the, the very technical information and try to connect the dots and what it means, was that they all kind of relied on me to have some kind of, I think, a, a a way to have uh, their thumb on, on the beat of the UCAB and the community, kind of say, okay, how, how, what do you think, Dave? How should we present this? Or what do you think would happen if, if you know if we just reached out to so-and-so and want to get the information to them? Because sometimes there was adversaries out there. You know, We wanted to kind of show that we had good faith effort to try to deliver the, the, the information, you know, that's factual for what we had at that time that was current. So my role was kind of give them some advice on what I think would avoid the, the landmines that were out there because there was always people out there trying to set you up for failure. And so we were able to kind of strategize where we could still deliver the information but not be uh, trapped or, or blindsided by something that kind of destroyed the whole, you know, reason why we were there, and mostly in the public setting. Um, but also, one of the things that, that I forgot to mention was, was when I was with Pima County DEQ, I forgot, because as the more I talk, the more I'm starting to recall that uh, EPA had hired the Pima County Department of Environmental Quality to do the very first private well study. And they assigned that project to me. Uh, I really don't know how they came up with that, but the fact that they did, I think primarily because I was Spanish speaking, there wasn't too many in our department then that understood hydrology and groundwater and knew the protocol for sampling, you know, 
So we uh, were tasked, uh, they gave Pima County DEQ uh, a budget to go out and, and identify because the EPA was concerned there was other private wells that were being used and hadn't been identified and people were drinking un you know, contaminated groundwater. So uh, I led that effort. We worked with uh, the Air Force, which has a, they're based out of San Antonio. It's kind of a, uh, they do studies within the Air Force, kind of like research health studies within the Air Force. Uh, so there was a different sister agency of the Air Force that kind of, we worked together. Mm -hmm. So they were going to do what they call, um, we were going to do duplicate sampling. So once we, I, I developed the plan, the study plan, uh, we got it approved by EPA and, and we went out and actually canvassed the whole south side to see if we could identify any wells that had never been discovered. So I had trained some of the staff there to go out and learn how to identify private wells that you have no access to the property. One way is that you can look on a power pole and there's a transformer on the power pole. And that usually indicates that the, you have a high uh, draw on some voltage because a, a, a pump in a, in a, in a well is, is, will phase, it'll, it'll cycle. So it's, it's, um, it draws power in a way where it can overpower the electricity to the home. So they have to somehow buffer that from the rest of the, the grid. So the, the transformer there is primarily mostly because you're, you're drawing high voltage for, for some reason to that property. So we drove around, we identify if there's any power poles with transformers or we could peek over a fence and we could kind of identify what a wellhead would look like, you know, typically, you know, that's for a, a private well. Now these wells are all exempt because uh, under state law, um, if you don't uh, pump any more than 35 gallons per minute, it's considered a private well, which is exempt from any regulatory oversight. So they're not required to sample the water. EPA can't come in and tell you, hey, look, you can't use this water or the state. So they're exempt well. So these people can use it for irrigation, for drinking, or other purposes like livestock. You know, some of these areas were, at some time, were small farms and ranches in that part of town. Uh, so we went out and canvassed the whole area. We came up with about 60 potential properties that could have had a well. We sent out a mailer. We asked for permission, and the purpose of our effort was to go and sample their water. If they had a well, uh, we would welcome. They would be free of charge to them, and we would share the information with them. Uh, so th the Air Force was going to duplicate the process, and what we decided was we would use one lab here in the state, and they would use a separate lab. So that way, there, there, if there was any uh, anomalies in the data, and it didn't seem right. We had two sets of data that would mirror each other. We could kind of flush out the bad data a little bit, I guess, is, is the simple way of why you do that. It kind of gives you some, some way to figure out if it's a false positive or a false negative. Mm -hmm. and, or do you have to go out and resample because you can't make that determination from the data you have. So we eventually were able to get, initially I think it was out of 60 we determined there was probably only 40 of those properties that really potentially probably had it still an intact well where there was accessible. We didn't know that it could have been abandoned. It could have been, it could have been collapsed and there's no way to access the groundwater. Now this is all going to target the shallow groundwater because most of these wells at that time only went down maybe 150, 200 foot roughly because mm -hmm. that's when the groundwater table is much higher. You know, these, this is time where, groundwater in Tucson was much higher than what it is now. So the wells weren't very deep, uh, but we were finally able to get a response after sending out the mailers. We got 12 property owners who were willing to allow us to come and sample the water. So we went and sampled it. We got the data. We, we presented it to UCAB and EPA. And then from that point forward, uh, EPA decided, well, you know what? We need to continue monitoring these wells and see if there's any others that we might not have gotten the first attempt. So we did it twice. And after that, I had left the county and went to the city so that I was able to oversee two studies. Mm -hmm. And I think now uh, uh, USGS does that private well study 
uh, Pima County doesn't do. I think they continue it for a while, and then now it's where I think USGS is is the lead agency on that, and they don't do it. I'm not sure they still do it annually, but uh, they do it periodically just to make sure there's no impact to these wells. That there's very few that were impacted. There was a couple. I think we determined that we're actually contaminated above the cleanup standard, the drinking water level. Um, and at that time, I think one of them had said that uh, they, they didn't care. They didn't want the government to come in and step in and assist them and trying to see if we could, they could reconnect to uh, city water service because that was you know the sole source of water for that property. One did. Um, and so the, at that time, the city of Tucson, the water department decided um, they agreed to pay for the connection because of most, if you're going to connect to a city water from from the main pipe water line to your property and into your house is, is the property owner's cost. Not, so they were able to provide, and then they what they did was they they discontinued pumping on that on that well, and were providing uh, they were delivering drinking water, bottled water, until they got connected to. Uh, Tucson Water Service, and that was the only one individual I remember that were willing to allow that uh, the city to assist. So you know that a lot of that was uh, my involvement with the county, and then uh, a lot of the later studies I wasn't involved much, but I'm very familiar with how it all started. And that was in the 1980s. It right? was uh, in the no, yeah, it was in the late 1980s, okay. right? Because I started with the city of Tucson in 1994. Okay, and then you mentioned. I thought it was really interesting what you talked about, about the liability when you were negotiating with as Tucson Water, um, like how much the different liabilities were divvied up, especially when uh, the Air Force or, I mean, it would be huge. Well, no, this was just the airport property. Oh, so, okay. so this is where, you know, the Raytheon and TARP was already decided. That was already running. They had mm -hmm. the treatment system up and running. We were still negotiating for just the airport property. Okay. We didn't have a remedy on site yet mm -hmm. like Raytheon did. Mm -hmm. The Air National Guard had their own remedy too. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention them. Burr Brown. So I forgot all this. this is all starting to come back. <laughs> so they all had, uh, the way it worked, you got the bigger plume under control. And then each individual source area, uh -huh. if, if you had a source area on your property, which the airport did, then you have to also come up with another remedy to clean up the groundwater. And then the Air National Guard also had something, had the same, and, and Burr Brown. So you don't hear much about Burr Brown because that site's been effective at clean up. Mm -hmm. Although I know when I started towards the last part of my career, there's a, an orphan site that the ADQ now is taking the lead that is somewhat in the area of Burr Brown. There was an undiscovered site that also had been impacted, so they're they're the lead agency on that. Uh, so things are are kind of always shifting around, and that's why it's so complicated and hard to grasp. Okay, who's doing what, and, and who's responsible for what, and who's paying for what? And and some in some ways, the same people are involved in different processes, and and so that's where like I think Fred Brinker and I had different roles depending on who we were talking to and, and, and where the city was involved, the airport authority was involved. Uh, and him and I would talk a lot because, you know, it, it was a way to kind of make sure that we got the facts out and that the information wasn't going to be distorted or misused. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, we the city of Tucson has gone through several city managers over that 25 years or something. So every time, fortunately, early on, we had city managers who were very, very informed on the project because they, they were born and raised here in Tucson. But as time evolved, we had city managers that came from out of state. And my role uh, was to talk to Fred, and, and, and the airport authority was uh, very involved with making sure that we're keeping the city manager informed, because you can understand how things got very political, keeping the mayor and council informed. So how do you how do you deal with that? So my role was, because there was a protocol within the city where the airport authority didn't was involved with that, my job was to make sure 
the, the chain of command and how that information was being shared. So a lot of times we get a new city manager and Fred and I would get together and say, look, uh, he'd get together with his uh, his boss uh, and we decide, okay, we, we need to update the city manager because we don't want him to get blindsided, for one. If the constituency, constituency is starting to uh, put pressure on the different wards that were affected by the airport Superfund site, which was Ward 1 and 5. So trying to keep not only the ward council members informed, but keeping the city manager informed and the mayor informed and making sure the information wasn't coming from different sources that was not correct or accurate. So we had to really think about, okay, do, when do we do it? You can't just jump in and say, okay, we got to do it because sometimes it's not necessary because we're not ready to share the information that we think is going to be forthcoming here soon, you know, because sometimes these studies would share, would, would shed new light on what's really going on, you know, in the subsurface. So once we had good information and we thought the time was right, we would go and meet. Fred and I would go and meet with the city manager and, you know, basically just present the information in a very short version. Mm -hmm. And what just this interview alone, you know, could, is taking, you know, some time. Can you imagine that the FaceTime we have with the city manager is very busy? You know, he doesn't have a couple hours to sit down. Look, this is the way it goes and this is how it is. And this is the city's responsibility. So trying to figure out what was really needed to give him a snapshot of what they need to know. Mm -hmm. And then they could decide how they want to deliver that information to the mayor and council to keep them informed because they want to be informed. And and that was kind of my role to, to let the other parties with the airport property kind of keep them in tune and say, okay, guys, I think, uh, I think we need to step up uh, because things are getting a little edgy over here, you know, in the, in the political arena. So we, we, maybe we need to go get the information to the right people now before somebody else comes in and gives them, information that, that that's not justifiable or, or just for a different purpose, you know, just to get everyone excited because they have a different agenda. So that was kind of my role, too, to kind of keep the city managers involved and, and keep them informed. And they appreciate it because they, they could deal with issues that would come up that I obviously would not know. Or maybe in, the, in, in some other format that maybe politically someone is trying to create some controversy and they could diffuse it. That was the main thing. Try to diffuse it so it wouldn't destroy the city's image because remember, I, my role has always been to continue to build trust with the community. So that's in kind of another way to kind of look at it because we wanted to make sure that the city was delivering factual, honest, and, trans and transparent information. And, and, and primarily, that was kind of a juggling act sometimes because of the media or other groups that would try to stir up things that were already discussed and resolved, and now it's come up again because, you know, either people weren't involved in early years or now they have a different purpose to get involved with for whatever reason. So we're always trying to deal with that to make sure that we can still make that progress that we've been making and continue to kind of stay on path on what we agreed to do and, and how we're effectively making some progress to clean up the groundwater. So that, that kind of all kind of is connected. And so politically, technically, <laughs> and within the community role, it's all of those things that I have to kind of think about and how do we effectively get the information in the right hands, mm -hmm. you know. And then what are you most proud of during your involvement or your contribution with the Unified Community Advisory Board? Well, the number one thing is I was able to continue and build on, on some cre credibility and, and trust with the community members. You know, as, as time went, there was different members. Um, I was always open to meeting with them personally, one-on-one, -on -one, which I had in the past several times. If they needed information that maybe it was hard for them to get. And I know there was information that was, because when you work with the government, once it's final, it, it's public information that, you know, anyone can submit a request to get documentation from the city. Uh, the newspapers do it all the time. It's called a FOIA request. It's a Freedom Information Act. I kind of remember the 
exact term, but you know, you and I can always go to the to any government entity and request information. There's a formal process. It might take a little while, but you you are you're a, have a legal right to get that information. So, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I I felt I needed to make sure that the UCAP always had access to the information they needed to help them understand the dynamics and the complexity of the whole project. And that sometimes took years because it took me a long time. And I had the technical background to kind of understand. I can imagine people that, that's why I have a lot of high respect for the people in UCAP, they're self-taught. They might have had some high school, maybe a little college education, but to understand science or engineering that gets into organic chemistry and thermal dynamics and I mean all those different things the words just hearing the word kind of scares you uh, hydrology geology you know how do you make some sense of it and so it's hard to to get that information extract what's important and put it in a version that's understandable for the layperson and that's kind of where my role I felt was always if like Yolanda and I always talked a lot, uh, she was always welcome to the, uh, when we had these meetings that finally we were with EP and ADQ and then it was the airport authority and then the other parties that were involved. We started inviting Yolanda to come. And so she could understand some of the discussion. It was all related to technical stuff, you know, engineering and hydrology. And I can see where it's overwhelming. Uh, I mean, but you have to hear it repeatedly as slowly you start to understand more and more and then someone else can explain it in a different way now it starts to make more sense so i think that's where it's helped yolanda a lot to kind of get some grasp of all the information that gets dumped out at the ucab members in, in in a 15 minute report and so they're they're people like me we, we deal with it every day you just kind of blurt it out but it doesn't make any sense if you don't put it in a way that people can understand so for her, I think it's been very helpful. Um, and then she can go back and share that with the rest of you camp members. And, and that's the intent, you know. That's why I think uh, Fred and I always agreed that we, we as, as much as possible, we had to be transparent because we knew that it could get very political, uh, especially with the city involved in our role. And our role was much different than his role because he's, he's not really a government entity. Airport Authority is not. Uh, but... We had to follow separate set of rules so anyone could, could ask, put pressure on the city to provide information. And a lot of times it wasn't fully vetted and it wasn't in final drafts. So there was a reason why you couldn't always share that information until it was already kind of gone through the quality control process and fully vetted. And then you knew it was accurate. And then that's when it could be shared. So that, that kind of, that's kind of where I felt my, my biggest contribution it was always behind closed doors. I mean, no one, because you just do it. You don't, you know, you don't really think much about it. You just kind of take it on as your own job and you take pride in it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I, I always felt that my, my role was to continue doing that, even though sometimes it was pretty difficult to do because uh, sometimes the city manager or mayor council just didn't want to listen, you know, and they didn't care because it was maybe a particular year it was controversial they were going to be reelected so they want to hear that kind of stuff because it could create a lot of you know ups it could cause some confusion and make some people upset you know so there's a lot of that stuff we had to always think about not that we were trying to hide anything but the fact we had to make sure it doesn't get overwhelmed with something that has nothing to do with what we're trying to accomplish yeah, you're dancing a very delicate yeah, dance. It yeah, seems. yeah, yeah. You always have to always go through the chain of command, you know. And sometimes your director didn't quite have time for you to to a point where you almost have to say, "Look, I'm here because it's important, not because I'm. I just want to sit here and chit chat, you know." So sometimes they get busy, you know. So you have to kind of make sure, shake them up a little bit to make sure that, look, I'm telling you this because we need to do these things, and I need your direction and telling me how we need to go about it. I have an idea and, and I'm gonna share it with you and then just let me know what we need to do. So that was always kind of my role, was always constantly doing, going back to the city and, and making sure everyone was well-informed 
Everyone was comfortable with the information and, and could always be comfortable with having a good understanding of what was being shared out in the public and, and, and in the media. So that was kind of my, a lot of the things that I was involved with. And then thinking back on your experience at the Tucson International Airport Area Superfund site, what would you recommend or like to see future generations learn from this experience? Well, one of the one of the things that's already been started and it, and it's been very uh, successful is uh, we had early on they were able to finding. I remember one of the the challenges the UCAB had is we were trying to be a more diverse group that represented the, the community. Uh, we didn't want just a few people that were very uh, involved in community, always the same ones. They wanted to have a good cross section of. And one of the areas was education. And so they reached out to Sunnyside School District, some of the schools that were affected. They were in the area, uh, Sunnyside High School and some of the middle schools and elementary schools. And we were able to recruit some teachers that were very interested in, in learning more about what was going on with the Superfund site. But then taking that back to the students and teaching them more in the science curriculum and developing a curriculum that they could use that was helpful for them to kind of continue that process in, in, in helping people be more aware. And, and people that have kids, I think that's what I reflect back when my kids would come to, from school. And, and your kid gets taught something and says, Dad, you know what? How come we're not recycling? And, and, and you start to think about that and you start, well, you got to have to answer. You got to have a good answer because obviously he, they've been told about what it is to be recycling, and you start to realize that it's important to your your children. You need to take ownership of that importance too. So I think that was the reason why reaching out to schools, students, so they could go back to their families because now they're more educated. They understand the issues, the topic. They can explain it to their parents or grandparents or other family members. So by, by getting good factual information out and, and trying to memorialize the history of all the people that have been involved and understanding how we got from back in the late 80s to now and what, has, what are some of the milestones and, and who's been involved and how we got in here, I think was all part of that effort trying to teach children in school because they're like sponges, you know, they, they understand if, if you can get them motivated and, and excited about the topic. I even went to visit a few uh, classes uh, because they were asking for some of the technical people that were willing to go talk to the class before they presented the, the assignment. And a lot of them did as group projects to go talk to these kids to talk more about the history of the Tucson Airport Superfund site. So that kind of progressed, and I think we've had some, some, a few teachers that are still involved that have been very good. They've got some grants, and they've been able to build on that success and continue to deliver it as, as teaching curriculum in some of the schools. Um, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a one great way to kind of continue the, the, the success that, that, that we've seen, but also to not forget how we got here. And I think that's kind of this effort, so to speak. You're trying to understand the history and trying to memorialize it in a way that we can go, always go back and try to see how we got to the point we're at. And I think that's one, one important thing that children are very good about, remembering and delivering uh, things that they share at school. And I think that's a great way of, of networking or outreaching to a larger community you know, that we don't have access to uh, through our schools. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, that's, I think, one good way that I think as we go forward, continue that effort. Uh, I think UCAP's done a great job. Uh, the, the current members on the UCAP are, are much more well-informed, much more educated. They understand the issues uh, because they've been there long enough now. I think they they feel comfortable with uh, what they get presented at these meetings. Uh, there's some continuity with Yolanda being there, several terms as, as the 
co-chair for the community. So all those things help build, I think, as they go forward. And, and, and some of the pioneers that, that kind of sporadically come back, I think that's good. Uh, Henry Vega is a classic example of that because he always reminds everyone of the, you know, it's one of those things where I, I said earlier, is we need people to challenge us sometimes. You know, and sometimes we don't like to, or we're not ready for that. But Henry's kind of that, that person that will make you think a little bit more than you think you've got it all figured out. And I, th I told Yolanda that he's, he's what UCAP needs. He's what everybody needs in those forums because he helps us to remember the things that are, matter the most, you know, our families, our health. You know, and how do we, how do we prevent from this happening again? And I think that's that's kind of key in, in having people like that, like Henry involved. And I know sometimes he he's not always as active, but it's hard when you've been involved for so long and and, and you have other commitments. And and that's why I always have great admiration for the people that are volunteering on UCAB. I. I was volunteering too. I wasn't getting paid for showing up, but the fact that yeah, I was, I wasn't getting paid overtime or anything. But yeah, I was still kind of representing the city. So in a way, I wasn't I wasn't like some of the uh, consultants that have to fly in from out of state. And of course, you know they're getting paid for coming and presenting to EPA and ADQ. But I think that's kind of one of the things as they go forward because UCAB is is I think has evolved where it's gone through a lot of growing pains, a lot of controversy, a lot of ups and downs and different people taking the lead and different important issues that have kind of uh, caught the interest of, kind of reopened some of the memories that people are have a hard time thinking about, especially when you have had family members that are have passed away or they're ill you know that's the toughest thing and then that topic comes up and it just brings back that memory i think ucab has a good way of balancing that where they're very concerned with those that have been impacted but yet we've made a lot of progress let's not regress we need to keep pushing forward but yes we're willing to hear your concerns and we're willing to address them as best as possible and if it's something new then we need to bring it up and so i think that's where ucab really has its its focus and it's more effective in, in managing all that as they go forward. Mm -hmm. And then how would you like your memory of your experience to be remembered? Uh, I think with just getting someone who uh, I worked with for a long time, just come up and say, hey, thanks. I appreciate you being, you know, always open to share or talk to me or get me information, whatever it is that I could do personally. I mean, I think the fact that it's kind of nice that Fred and I were probably, and I start thinking, the only two names that were put on the plaque that's at the Valencia Library. So that in itself was a big honor because it's funny, we Fred and I talk about this often. It's a man, who's been on this project longer when we talk about outside of UCAB and we talk to other people and they say, well, Fred's been on the longest, but Dave's been on a long time too. So we, we kind of joke about it. And, um, but I think just the satisfaction that, you know, I've been able to at least help someone understand a little bit more about the project and why it's, uh, there's so much information to understand and how do you digest that and make some sense of it, you know, and I think that as you go forward, you have to appreciate it. Once in a while, I'll talk to Londa, which will reach out to me and ask me something, you know, and, and I'm always willing to talk to her, call her. And so those little things, I think, are is kind of my personal satisfaction that I built that relationship, and, and it's a lasting relationship, so it's kind of nice that Okay, you haven't always succeeded with everyone, but there's a few people that you know that can kind of say, yeah, you know, we can always trust Dave. He'll give us the information we need, and it's it's trustworthy. We don't have to worry about him hiding anything, and even less now that I work for the city. But not that I hide hit anything before. You know, it's uh, it's one of those things. You know, you can already do so much that uh, I think uh, people don't understand that you have a legal responsibility 
And then you have another responsibility that sometimes you don't have the same limitations. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's hard because you have information, but legally you're not allowed to disclose it because it just hasn't been vetted out and hasn't been uh, to a point where now it can become public information. And so I think that's that was my biggest internal challenge. Okay, how do you how do you know what you can and can't when it's not easy to turn it off and then start talking about something that, that overlaps quite a bit. You know, it's it's really hard. So you get you get better at it as, as you start to get out in the public. But you know, I think that would be my my. My, my way of remembering my my accomplishment is just the personal relationships I was able to build with, with all the people in the past, whether it was on, on the technical side with consultants or other responsible parties or the, the UCAP members and the public in general. I think uh, that's the way I see my value mm -hmm. over time. So these are all the questions that I have. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Um, gosh. No, I think I've talked long. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think one of the things that I, I I've always thought about. I had a hard time leaving UCAP because because of the relationships that I've built with some of the people. You know, they've been there so long. And they asked me, "Dave, you need to come back." And I, you know, back then I had to leave for personal reasons. It wasn't because I I I, I retired and. Hey, I'm done. I'm over this. Uh, you know, it was mostly for health reasons. So, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe uh, I still kind of stay in touch with some of the people, and I, I still am interested to see how things are moving along. So, that's probably the last thing I'd, I'd like to add. I, I'm still somewhat involved, even though I don't live there in the South Side or actively work with, you know, the project. But it's hard to cut off some of that that you've been associated for so long mm -hmm. it's still kind of inside me so I, I i i tend to want to know what's going on yeah well thank you very much for your time and all the history you provided well you're very welcome i i really appreciate the opportunity um, you, you gave me um i never thought about how to put 24 years plus into a short you know summary of what what's happened and, and it's been kind of it's been kind of fun and interesting for me to be able to remember all this, all the things that, that I've dealt with. So I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to, to be here too. Yeah, and hands down, like I mentioned, everybody said I had to interview you. So. <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate those kind thoughts, and I, I really do hope everyone, wish everyone well with, with you know, that's involved with the project uh, and I think it's in a much better place now, so I think I think it'll continue to be that way, especially with the people they have involved with UCAP. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much then. <laughs> uh, thank you very much.